Hi everyone and thank you for the invitation to present at today's event. I'm delighted to be sharing with you my thoughts on self-determination or protection, legal obstacles for the full realisation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Europe. My name is Professor Eleanor Flynn and I am the Director of the Centre for Disability Law and Policy at the National University of Ireland, Galway. In today's talk, I want to cover a couple of key topics, starting with the right to self-determination in the CRPD. And here I will be talking specifically about the content of Article 12 on equal recognition before the law, which I think is one of the core elements of the right to autonomy and the right to self-determination in the Convention. Then I want to move on to talk about how we can protect the totality of the person's human rights. Often when we hear protection contrasted with self-determination, it's with the view of safeguarding the person, keeping them safe, protecting them and keeping them safe. But I want us to shift our focus and think not just about simply keeping the person safe, but protecting the totality of the individual's human rights. And finally, then I'm going to talk about some key areas of law reform which are necessary to address in all European countries uh, in order to realize the full vision of the Convention. That includes adult guardianship, criminal responsibility, involuntary detention and treatment, and adult protection and safeguarding. So let's begin by considering how self determination as a right is framed within Article 12 of the Convention. Article 12 of the Convention maintains that persons with disabilities have the right to enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. Legal capacity in this context, of course, means the power to not only be a holder of rights under the law, but an actor under the law, which means the person must have the ability to enter and exit contracts, including making decisions about relationships, getting married, uh, also making decisions about one's finances or what healthcare treatment a person would like to have or to refuse. And it's important that that article says in all aspects of life, because this covers a wide range of decision making rights and areas of self determination. And again, what we're looking for here is simply equality with non disabled people who have been free to take risks and make sometimes unwise decisions in many areas of their life without having their self-determination removed or restricted. Importantly, Article 12 also requires that states provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require in exercising their legal capacity. And this provision is quite unique in human rights law. It's the first time we see this obligation on states to ensure that people have support to exercise legal capacity. And I'll return to that concept in a moment when I talk about what kinds of support would be human rights compliant with this provision. Another key element of Article 12 is its recognition that safeguards may be necessary for measures relating to the exercise of legal capacity. But very importantly, this part of the article states that those safeguards must respect the rights, will and preferences of the person. So this is where the concept of will and preference, which is now very prevalent in human rights discourse about self-determination comes from. It comes from the language of Article 12. And will and preferences refers to the will in one sense that can be understood as the person's vision of the good life for themselves, their overarching priorities and goals for themselves. And the preferences can be understood as more immediate likes and dislikes the individual may have. And both have to be considered holistically together. It's not sufficient to ignore a preference in favour of the will or vice versa. So it's important that we try to understand all of the person's wishes in the context of their broader plans for their life and also their day to day decision making likes and dislikes. And the best way to keep people safe is to ensure that we are monitoring supports to exercise legal capacity in accordance with whether those supports are respecting the will and preferences of the individual. And that is very different to the measures like adult guardianship that we have had in place up until now. Finally, I want to emphasize that Article 12 places a specific importance on financial decision making and self-determination. 
and it requires states to ensure the equal right of persons with disabilities to own or inherit property and control their own financial affairs. So you'll notice that the convention uses that term legal capacity, but in many contexts, in, in many pieces of legislation in different European countries, the term that's used is mental capacity or some equivalent term. So I think it's important to clarify the difference between these two um, in order to ensure that we're actually achieving the right to self-determination. So what is the individual's mental capacity? That relates to the individual's decision-making abilities or skills. How good is the person at making decisions? It is something which we think in scientific terms and in legal terms can be measured. We can measure the person's ability or skill at decision making. And most commonly nowadays in legal systems, it is measured in accordance with something called the functional test, which has four criteria. Does the person understand the information relevant to the decision, including the outcomes of the decision? Do they are they able to use and weigh information in terms of their choices and options? Are they able to weigh them up and consider them? Are they able to retain or remember the information about the decision? And then can they communicate whether by speech, uh, verbal communication, gestures, a body language, in writing, in sign language, some method of communication of their decision to others? So typically when a person is not fulfilling one or more of those four criteria, then they will not be considered to have mental capacity. And many legal systems will then deny the individual's legal capacity. That is the power to make decisions that the law recognizes, like making a will or getting married or entering a contract or giving consent to medical treatment. So if we were to take the requirements of the convention and in particular Article 12 seriously, then we need to move away from focusing on and attempting to test or assess the individual's skill at decision making. And instead, we need to move towards an approach that invites us to discover and interpret that person's will and preferences to understand what does the person want for their own life and how can we support them to achieve that goal. So how big a problem is this focus on assessing the individual's decision making ability when it comes to the right to self-determination? I would argue it's a global and not just a pan-European problem. But importantly, many countries are learning that by restricting the person's power to make legally binding decisions, whether through adult guardianship or any of the other measures I mentioned in the name of protection, but the reality is that this does not, in fact, protect people from exploitation and abuse. We have seen countless examples of how people placed under guardianship have been exploited or abused by their guardians and by others. And I would use the analogy that it is similar to how people were placed in institutions in order to protect them. And we know now and have always known about abuses that occurred in those institutional settings. So it's part of the same problem. We need to move away from this idea that stripping the individual of their power to choose is actually a protection and we need to support the individual to make their own choice. So this is the view and not only of researchers and scholars, but of the human rights experts who make up the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, who have criticized this approach, which they term substitute decision making and called for states to replace it with supported decision making. And why have the UN Committee done this? Because they argue that these approaches that deny disabled people decision making power are discriminatory because non-disabled people are not stripped of their ability to make legally binding choices in the same way. Similarly, the committee has noted that a capacity assessment, so that testing process or criteria to determine whose choices will be respected by the law is very value laden and very subjective. It is certainly not an exact science and it is problematic to base our legal um, powers to make choices in our lives on something that is so uncertain. So instead of that approach, the UN committee is arguing that we can do better by focusing on what the person actually wants and supporting them to get it, or at least as close to it as possible. Acknowledging again that all of our, our desires for our own lives are not always going to be possible to meet. And yet it is that process of trying to understand what those desires are and how we can get the person closer to those goals 
that the human rights approach of the convention invites us to take. So I mentioned a moment ago that the UN committee has been calling on countries since the very beginning of its work to abolish systems of what it describes as substitute decision making and replace them with supported decision making, which is more compliant with the right to self-determination. So what does the committee mean when it says substitute decision making? The committee has now clarified this in General Comment 1 and provided a definition of a substitute decision making system that violates the individual's human rights. So the criteria are first, a system that allows for legal capacity to be removed from the individual, even if this is only done for a single decision. This clarification has been very important because many countries in Europe and around the world argued that, okay, plenary guardianship or full or total guardianship systems where the person was not allowed to make any legally binding decisions Perhaps those are unnecessary or need to be reformed, but surely we can keep some systems of partial guardianship. And the committee has been very clear on this point that that is not acceptable from a human rights standpoint, because even to remove the individual's power to make one decision is still a violation of their human rights. And this is the case in a situation where either the court or some other body or tribunal um, who is stripping the individual of their legal power is appointing another person to make that decision. So in some cases that will occur. If someone is appointed as a guardian, for example, and they can be appointed over the individual's objections. So if I do not want a guardian, but a judge can still appoint me one, then that would be a violation of my human rights if that person is given the power to make decisions on my behalf and I no longer have that power myself. The other way in which a human rights violation can occur is that the decisions being made by a substitute decision maker are based not on my own wishes or my will and preference, but rather on what someone thinks is in my best interests. So this paternalistic approach, particularly for adults, of focusing on best interests is something that the UN committee is asking for all states to move away from. So what should we be moving towards? What is the system of supported decision making that would give a greater protection for the totality of the individual's human rights that the UN committee is asking states to achieve? Well, it has some important components. First of all, it must be something that is available to all disabled people, regardless of the level or severity of their impairment and regardless of the level of their support needs. So it cannot be something that is only given to people with low support needs or only given to people with high support needs. Every person with a disability who wishes to have support to exercise their legal capacity must have it according to the UN committee. Again, we return to that point of safeguards being based on will and preferences. So not safeguards based on best interests, but instead focus on the person's wishes. Another key issue for support is that the person's communication style or their lack of financial resources must not be a barrier to accessing support. So you shouldn't need to be someone who is verbal or speaking in order to access support. You also should not need to have your own financial resources to pay for support. It should be freely available to anyone who requires it. The person must have the option to have their supporters legally recognized. So some people may want to make a legally binding support agreement with one or more supporters who assist them in making decisions and to use that document when they go to the bank or the doctor or anywhere to ensure that the supporter is involved in the decision making process. So that option must be available to people, even if many people will still want to continue, as most of us do, with informal support by having the support of friends and family that we can take advice from when we make decisions, but not necessarily have any legally binding agreement with them. It must never be used to limit other fundamental rights. So the fact that I use support in making financial decisions should never be used as a justification to prevent me from making a decision about my relationship or about getting married, for example. And finally, crucially, it is important that the person can refuse support, can change the support agreement they have, or end the support relationship at any time. And this is really critical for self-determination. If we're going to impose something on someone, we cannot, according to the UN committee, call that support. It is something else if it is going to be imposed. 
So now that we have a clearer sense of what the UN Committee is asking for, I want to move on to consider what kinds of protections um, would comply with the human rights approach. So I mentioned at the beginning this notion of respect for the totality of the individual's rights, not just the right to be safe or free from harm or free from exploitation, which is a right under the convention, but it's not the only right. And I use the phrase here that Baroness Hale used in a key decision from the UK Supreme Court, where she noted with respect to disability specific forms of deprivation of liberty, that a gilded cage is still a cage. So the things that we have imposed on individuals in order to protect them or keep them safe have damaged their human rights in other areas. And we need to look at what supports we can offer instead of what coercive measures we impose on the individual in order to protect the full spectrum of the person's human rights. What really actually keeps people safe is something we need to consider. And we know that institutionalization does not keep people safe. In fact, we know that having more people in the person's life who know them, especially people who are not paid to be there, people who we might describe as natural support or family and friends, neighbors, peers, uh, you know, co-workers, people in our community, having those people in our lives who know us and look out for us, that is what keeps people safe. And that is not something that a legal framework is ever really going to provide for an individual. But that is what we need to build on and achieve and look at the state's obligation to ensure that people do live in environments where they can create those connections within their communities. Another key protection that can help to ensure that people are both safe and have their human rights respected is to recognize that the individual has what we call the dignity of risk. So each of us enjoys the, the opportunity to make mistakes, to learn from those mistakes or perhaps not to learn from them, but to have that dignity of risk. And this is uh, something that comes up a lot, particularly with disabled people's choices of where and with whom to live. And not just disabled people, but older people too especially common in my context would be where an older person wants to continue living at home, um, even in situations where they now need a lot of support and they may not have the access to that support or have um, may not want that support in their home, but they want to stay living at home, even though others would prefer them to enter a nursing home or a more secure environment because they might be, for example, at risk of falling and injuring themselves. And again, in another important English case, there was a decision about whether a woman, an elderly woman had capacity to choose to live in her own home. And she talked about the risk of falling and was clear that this was a risk for her. But her perspective was, if I die on my own floor, I die on the floor. I'd much prefer to die in my own home. I really would. So acknowledging that people are weighing up the risks inherent in their choices and giving them the dignity to allow them to take those risks, not abandoning individuals to risk by any means, but rather providing all the support to help the person to mitigate any risks to themselves, and then documenting the person's clear and consistently expressed will and preferences to make a decision that others consider to be risky. That is what will protect individuals, um, including protecting supporters from liability for having respected that decision, even though it is a risky decision. And that also brings up the issue of the interpretation of the individual's will and preferences. So the UN committee has acknowledged that there may be situations, very hard cases, very challenging situations where we don't really know exactly what the person's wishes are, or the person may be expressing conflicting will and preferences. And in these cases, we may at some point have to do our best to interpret how we should apply the person's will and preferences to the present situation. But they are clear that that is not a violation of the individual's human rights because it is focusing and attempting to get as close as possible to the person's own wishes as the basis for any decision being made in that context. I want to share an example from a Canadian project um, led by families and disabled people about informal safeguards. So I'll just read the example on the slide. A number of years ago, Josh and I had been out walking. We stopped back at the house for a quick minute and I left him sitting at the front door in his wheelchair. A few minutes later, I returned to find that he had maneuvered out of his seatbelt, over the foot pedals, out the gate and was gone. 
I ran to the street, looking both ways. My heart was pounding. He was not to be seen. I retraced my steps, searching the yard and house, thinking he couldn't have gotten away so fast. He had. In a panic, I called out to neighbours and a search party of about 12 gathered. Some went left, others went right and some stayed put. I was a mess. He was so vulnerable walking and on the streets. Well, a short time later, he was found safe and sound a block away, exploring a barbecue that had been left out for recycling. One of the neighbours on this street saw him and stayed with him, knowing that he wouldn't be out on solo journeys. Another neighbour found the two of them holding hands and chatting and got another neighbour to come back and get me to come help convince Josh to come back home. So this really demonstrates the power of living in a community where people know you, where people know that you may not be someone who would typically be out by yourself. Um, and this brings to mind for me an example of a very prominent um, civil rights activist in Northern Ireland, John Hume, who developed dementia in his later years of life and sometimes was found wandering around the city of Derry. And any time he was found, because he was so well known, he would be returned to his home by, by somebody who, some passerby, any taxi driver who ever encountered him out walking alone, knew to check and see whether he needed a lift home. And so it's by being known by people in our communities that we can really be kept safe rather than by institutionalizing people and denying people the right to make choices for themselves. So what does this mean for the reforms at the legislative level that would be needed in most, if not all, European countries and indeed globally as well? So I think one of the most clear areas of reform that's necessary is adult guardianship or um, trusteeship, conservatorship, wardship. All these terms are used as examples of substitute decision making. And all of these are things that need to be abolished where they meet the committee's definition of substitute decision making. And we need to replace those systems fully with supported decision making. So it's not sufficient to introduce supported decision making alternatives, but leave some form of guardianship in place. And this is something that has happened in many European countries and we need to do better. We need to do more because we have data from those countries that demonstrates as long as guardianship is an option, it will continue to be used. And in some cases, the, the numbers of individuals being admitted to full or plenary guardianship are not reducing and are even in some countries increasing, even though supported decision making alternatives have been introduced. So this is a problem and we need to work on that. And there are countries, particularly our colleagues in Latin America, in Peru, in Colombia, in Costa Rica, who have shown us how this can be done and how you can completely abolish all forms of substitute decision making under the law and replace them with supported decision making. Involuntary detention and treatment, particularly in the context of mental health laws, this is an ongoing issue for all European countries, and we all still need to work to abolish these forms of involuntary detention and treatment, wherever they include a criteria about the individual's disability, impairment, or in my context, the term mental disorder is used to justify involuntary detain, involuntarily detaining individuals alongside considerations of risk of harm to self or others. So this is an approach that the UN committee has also been very clear, needs to be abolished. We need to replace these with non-coercive alternatives for support in the community. And we need to replace this with an approach to informed consent to medical treatment, including in mental health treatment, to ensure that individuals where they refuse treatment will have the confidence that their refusal will be respected. When it comes to adult protection and safeguarding, um, this is a live issue for us in Ireland at the moment where there are plans to introduce safeguarding legislation, which we have not had in law before. And this is something we're very concerned about from a disability rights perspective, because again, it, often these systems either explicitly or implicitly discriminate against disabled people and impose restrictions on disabled people's decision making because of safeguarding concerns, which we would never impose on non-disabled people in similarly risky situations. One example I typically use in this context is about domestic violence. So we know, for example, that many survivors of domestic violence continue living with a violent partner, even when it's risky and it's dangerous to do so. That is the process before people feel able or ready to leave a violent or risky situation. And so we would never impose the requirement on the individual 
you know, experiencing the violence to leave that situation or remove them from that situation against their consent. What we would do is continually offer support to the person, make sure they know that there are alternatives, that there are services to support them, that there is alternative housing available, that there would be support for them and any children they may have, and so on. So that is the kind of approach that we need to develop as well for disabled people or others who may be vulnerable to exploitation to ensure that they have their totality of their rights protected and that they are not having coercive measures imposed on them against their will because ultimately that will not keep them safe in the long run. And finally, one other issue that needs attention is the area of criminal responsibility. Again, many European countries have disability specific provisions in their criminal law, including measures such as the insanity defense or fitness to plead or fitness to stand trial criteria that specifically target disabled people and find them unfit to stand trial, which can result in their diversion into forensic psychiatric settings, potentially indefinitely in some cases. So the UN committee has been very clear again that we need to remove those disability specific measures because they are discriminatory and we need to replace them with measures that are disability neutral. So that would include, for example, having criteria that apply equally to everyone as to whether an individual is fit to stand trial. And if the person is not fit to stand trial for a wide range of reasons, then the person cannot be detained in any other form of detention. The person has to be, like any other individual under the criminal law, released from custody and free to have their right to liberty respected. So that's just a, a flavour, I guess, a taste of some of the issues that require attention in the European context. And I've included on the final slide here some further resources for reading more about the issues that I've mentioned. I'm very happy to um, follow up by email with anyone who has questions about this material as well. And I would encourage you to to continue your good work of achieving law reform in the different European context in which you're all working.